academic medicine, uh, minority tax, gratitude tax, and emotional tax. So the minority tax is a feeling of being treated as a token, as a person whose value is minimal to the organization, is pervasive across disciplines and demographics. That's one way of describing it. So that tokenization, you're there, but you're not really given much power or not able to influence much. You're just kind of there as like a shiny object. And the value that you do not have is communicated to you in a number of different ways. And you can experience this in a number of different settings. Another way of describing the minority tax is specifically in medicine that doctors are given increased responsibilities in recruitment, mentorship, or other diversity efforts. And you see that and its consequences in who's present for diversity efforts, um, the experiences of being that token and how you're exposed to racism, how you experience isolation, how you do or do not have access to mentorship, the kinds of clinical responsibilities that you also have to be responsible for, and then your access to promotion. Um, that taxed nature of our involvement with uh, medical education and beyond, including as faculty, is something that I, I'm sure many of you have had conversations about. Maybe not so much have there been conversations about the emotional tax. This is the emotional toll of defending or explaining one's underrepresented history, identity, and culture to non-underrepresented colleagues. Exhausting. <laughs> Exhausting. Um, I still remember... Um, jokes uh, during my medical school time where they would talk about uh, Black people and other racialized minorities taking spots away from others rooted in affirmative action. So this idea that you're not supposed to be there is not only reinforced by the institution, but your peers, some of them can believe that as well. And then you have to spend time proving that you, you deserve to be there and that you're competent and you're credible and confident enough to actually get the job done. Another tax that is not discussed often, but I've, I've had these conversations, is the gratitude tax. Um, this feeling of obligation that you have to stay at the place that gave you an education or, or provided you some training. And that there's an obligation to contribute to future generations because you were given this seat, you were given this opportunity um, to be a physician. And I'm very clear on the language there, um, being given, right? Um, the reality is that you earned your spot. But in this particular way of thinking, you were given this opportunity and now you owe certain things. That affects our decision making. It affects our personal ambitions. Um, there are articles written about where people go um, by race and ethnicity. And there is a, a disproportionate amount of those who are both racial ethnic minorities and also um, uh, foreign medical students who are in places of the highest need. So in these community health settings that are under-resourced, there's a disproportionate amount of those groups, those demographic groups there. And I can personally attest to this. I want to be where I am. I am at a federally qualified health center in a very limited resource area with a mountain of debt. But I also have to be honest that there is a gratitude tax that drove my decision making about what would be possible for me. Uh, and being transparent about that hopefully is helpful to you all so that you can factor that in into your own decision making. Um, there's also this sense that your institution made you, um, so you shouldn't go elsewhere. And that's that expectation that you would forego promotion or advancement at other places because this place gave you a spot um, so that you should stick around and stay. So what are some of the consequences of the minority tax? So there's currency to medical uh, education, to medical training, um, depending on how academic your institution is, it might be academic currency um, that's relevant or important um, and helps you to, for example, um, achieve a promotion. In other more clinically focused spaces, it might be your access to leadership positions like administrative roles, things of that nature. So when you're performing these tax duties, you have to balance how those tax duties pull you away from some of those other things, those currencies that might get you to a certain place um, where you want to be. And then you also have to contend with those being discounted as not being scholarship, not being leadership, and not being promotion worthy. And uh, more recently, there are some changes there. And we'll talk about that towards the end about some strategies that you can adopt to make sure that you're accessing those, those reforms where this kind of work uh, with the minority tax is scholarship worthy, is leadership worthy, and also promotion worthy. But a lot of times it's not recognized as such.
Additionally, tax duties are often not compensated and not valued. Um, huge transition for me as a trainee, now as an attending, and I am being compensated in a number of different ways for my minority tax burden. And that could be financial, that could be with access to other opportunities based on someone valuing your, uh, your leadership or valuing your scholarship or valuing what you've contributed in ways that says to them, hey, this person is worthy of additional opportunities. Um, when, when it's not compensated and not valued, you're spending so much energy without much of a return. Um, tax duties are often aren't often offered with protected time, which means nights, which means weekends, which means time away from family, friends, loved ones, um, spent engaging in these tax duties. I don't know a person uh, who's positioned similar to me who is not exhausted um, and in need of more protected time to do the things that they wanna do and sometimes the things that they're really pushed to do. In addition, tax-related duties aren't equally distributed. Some people have a tax and some people do not, uh, among students, amongst residents, fellows, and faculty. And that's a problem. Um, I, in every stage of my journey, have recognized how much time I was spending on tax duties and how much time others were spending writing papers um, or building their, their professional network or um, engaging in research or just going out for a run <laughs> or a nice meal or things of that nature. So that lack of equity, that lack of equal distribution um, specifically is, is very difficult to, to navigate as well. And another um, consequence, which is very interesting, you'll see with some of the information I'll present in a moment, is that it can result in people thinking that you're not a credible professional, that you aren't clinically um, what you need to be, or that academically, you're not where you need to be because you've been doing those DEI things, um, which is fascinating because in other spaces, the skills that you've developed, the knowledge that you have, the attitudinal shifts that you've been able to adopt from engaging in that work is valuable. And we'll, we'll talk about some language for that in just a moment. Um, but you can be convinced that you're spending time on that work is just a side hustle, just this thing that you do that doesn't have any relevance to your clinical work or your academic pursuits. And that's actually very incorrect. So another experience, and this was during residency. And uh, I don't recall why this was called the SWAT team. It was fun, I guess, at the time to be a part of the SWAT team. I was there in a similar fashion um, because people repeat themselves um, as I was in medical school. So in residency, again, I was carving out my own time to be on this recruitment team that was specifically focused on making sure that residents that came, uh, medical students who came through um, were attended to in ways that gave them a clear sense of what the program could offer and the kind of culture that they would become a part of should they come to the residency program. So the SWAT team required us to have meetings. We engaged in some strategic direction being offered to program administration. And what happened with the SWAT team after that? It's gone. It disappeared. I checked my own resume, my own CV, and SWAT team is not on there. And I spent a couple years, if not two and a half, maybe three years on the SWAT team. So much of my residency, I was there alongside program administration, along with other residents and some fellows helping to shape their recruitment efforts of folks like myself and others with marginalized identities. And the richness of that experience was not even placed on my, my resume or CV. Um, so my question for you all, if you're able to mentalize this a bit based on your own experiences, is why was this left off of my resume or CV? Um, why was it not on there um, as a representation of something that at the time and still is really important to me? And also, if you can conceptualize this, a representation of a particular set of knowledge, uh, of knowledges, of particular attitudes, and also skills that would be relevant to that particular work. So why was this left off of my resume and CV? And you could just kind of think through some of those responses and we'll see if there's some responses at the end. So I wanna pivot a bit now to the shifting cases for diversity. And th this could be an entire conversation in and of itself. I just wanted to offer a little bit of historical context so we can kind of understand why things are just so messy 
at this time as it relates to diversity and more broadly the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Um, so the history of our country is one that has produced a, a, a consequences. And those consequences of racial injustice are that we have a lot of, institu had and still do, a lot of institutions that were not uh, at one point open to racialized minorities and specifically Black Americans, and at some point open to and hostile towards in ways that prevented matriculation, for example, into educational institutions or even just getting a job in a hospital and being credential enough to perform surgery or credential sufficiently. So what's the what's the timeline of this? You know, we have to take into account the legal aspect and that that pivot. Um, from this court case in the Supreme Court is very relevant to the messiness of DEI at this time. So um, there was a commitment from leadership in our country, some, to rectify those historical injustices by adopting affirmative action efforts, which were geared towards um, not just Black people, but specifically tied to that racial injustice, but also women. Uh, and over time, it was um, it was a part of what we did. And you saw numbers jump up for matriculation into places. And that, that matriculation was not because people were underqualified or any of that rhetoric. It was because they were finally having some kind of teeth um, to their, their right, their access to um, being in those institutions if they meet criteria. Um, what happened in 1978 is that there was a, course, uh, a case in the Supreme Court, the Bakke case. And that Bakke case forced a change in the case for diversity um, and actually became a case for diversity uh, in this way. Instead of us saying, okay, we can use race to correct those historical racial injustices and we can have these quotas that represent us creating space for the first time to these groups of people, we can't do that anymore because of Baki. So what we had to do um, was make a case for diversity to the Supreme Court that would allow race to be considered uh, and that's what race is now. It's considered as a part of diversity that benefits the whole. Um, so if you have diverse representation in a classroom, it benefits the whole. I'm sure that's something that you've heard before. That that line, that, that way of thinking, that ideology comes from a necessity to protect race-based admissions or race-based um, decisions into employment in a way that honored the decision that came down in the Supreme Court in the Bakke case. So now we have this diverse case for diversity that's about benefiting other learners in the room, um, contributing to the kind of ideas that come forth, et cetera. And that's kind of where we are um, now. And also there are efforts to even rid us of that focus on uh, that little bit of a remainder of affirmative action in some of the court cases happening right now. And you see Fisher uh, is mentioned there, but I'm not gonna go into detail with that. So what we have seen more now are um, first a business case for diversity. There was an article that came out in the 1970s um, that was projecting that in the 2000s, the workforce would be incredibly diverse. And that means that employers had to figure out how are they going to integrate their workforce? Quite literally, how are they gonna integrate their workforce and create this environment um, where people could work together well? So there was lots of initiatives for that, such as racial sensitivity training, et cetera. And to convince people to sustain those sorts of efforts, the business case was created. And you should know the business case because the business case might be the thing that helps you with your strategies later. So what is a business case for diversity? This means that they've done a lot of research to document that if you have diversity present, it can support, for example, in healthcare, quality of care and financial performance goals. Think about a no-show rate. Um, people are going to come to appointments with Dr. Isom, for example, because they feel connected to me in a very particular way. That helps to keep the lights on. So there's a very uh, concrete way of thinking about that. Also in the business case, addressing racism and other biases can give organizations a competitive advantage, helping them attract the best talent and elevate their brand and reputation. Think about on the interview trail, um, how these different programs who value you will be showing off their competitive advantage, their competitive edge um, by maybe talking about their DEI efforts, their anti-racism efforts, or maybe parading or maybe accurately representing um, the presence of diversity, um, equity, and inclusion in their program. So there's a business case to that because they want the best people at their programs. And that might be the reason why they're investing in um, diversity efforts. And that can help you figure out what kind of relationship you'll have with your tax. And we'll talk about that later. More recently, and then kind of throughout the, the decades, there's been a moral case for diversity. It's always been there. I think it was highest during the civil rights era, again, around that affirmative action 
time where it was first coming out and they were really focused at the time on just doing what was right. Not everyone, but enough of a critical mass plus enforcement from the federal government and other places that that's what we were doing. The moral argument that you might hear are that if we have more diversity in these spaces, it will close the gap on health disparities, or it will help us build trust and empathy with communities, kind of strengthen our relationship, and that's really important to us as an institution. These, again, are some of the cases that are presented that might help you in your, um, your advocacy for making the tax actually work for you. So um, an example of this is me being the diversity chief. Um, well, me, me being um, appointed as a diversity chief in my, my fourth year of my residency program, and then we actually changed that language to be chief resident of diversity and inclusion, which was very strategic on my part and my co-chief's part. Diversity chief does not communicate the same thing as chief resident of diversity and inclusion. It says something a bit more. It also stretched our focus beyond that. Um, but we did a lot in that year as two fourth year residents with informal um, DEI experience who were in their second um, run and the program at second run of having this position and being asked to do all kinds of things. Um, and one of the things that we did was we had office hours um, and in these office hours, we had faculty come see us from across the department. We had students come see us. We even had a, um, an applicant come see us just to hear more about our position and things of that nature. Um, we also were a, a, like a prototype, an example of this effort. So we would present to the Graduate Medical Education Committee for the hospital so that their other programs like internal medicine and things like that could adopt a similar approach to supporting um, DI and uh, in their particular departments. Um, we advocated for having protected time um, so we could attend meetings such as the administrative meetings with the program director and the site, um, the clinical site directors and all that good stuff. We did presentations to PA students, um, to nursing students. We went to conferences and represented the department um, and its, its, its investment in this particular position. And we also wrote a paper um, that came out as well. And in the department, there was lots of enthusiasm for our contributions. People knew that we were the chief residents of diversity and inclusion, et cetera. But the question is, is how would you represent that work outside of the department? Because people likely don't know that I had this position, <laughs> you know, after spending all this time, including not having as much supervision and mentorship as I would have needed to be as successful as I wanted to be. But, you know, we did all this work, we had some deliverables, some outcomes. And the question would be for you, had you been in this position, how would you represent that? Um, so I'll give you a few moments to think about that. How would you represent this work or similar work outside of the department? Because the goal here is to think about how you might leverage your tax to work to your benefit, which means people have to know the work that you're engaged in and you have to creatively figure out how will you actually showcase that work um, in ways that maybe are burdensome to you or maybe not. And I'll talk about one of what I'm, at my program one of the ways that was really helpful for me, <laughs> which was making friends with um, the person who wrote the newsletter. So if I had an award um, or if I um, passed an action paper in the assembly for the American Psychiatric Association, or if I had a community service event, which I did um, during residency, I would take pictures or um, send that announcement to the person in charge of the website and would end up on the Yale website. And what currency is that? That's currency from Google, right? So if you Google my name, some of the things that you'll see is my program and its announcements about the work that particular people were doing. So again, that, um, that gives you some kind of um, internet trail that can also, one, keep that memory alive of what you did and two, um, give people a sense of what that work was like. Uh, another tax uh, experience for me was presentations. Can you present on X, Y, and Z? And these were presentations um, here that I have listed from my CV. Um, I have so many presentations <laughs> that at this point, this is not up to date in any way, shape, or form. There's many missing from here, but I wanted to highlight what I wrote on my CV and how I was thinking about at the time what was of value. Um, so as you can see here, there's some mention of presentations at annual meetings, conferences for the APA. There's also a presentation here from ADPERT, which is the Association of uh, Program Directors for Psychiatry. 
And then I have another conference here, Rebellious Psychiatry at Yale, um, where I added some presentations. And there's just a lot of stuff that's not here. And the interesting thing is that sometimes we'll think about the value of a talk as where it's given, but I would stretch us to think about the value of a talk as in as what you are trying to accomplish. Um, so sometimes people are presenting just so you can remember stuff or so that you can understand something. And a lot of times with these kinds of presentations listed here, you're helping people apply knowledge, analyze issues, evaluate their current context, and maybe even supporting them in creating things, right? And that's a complex talk to give, right? That's a complex objective to have for a presentation. And it requires some abstract things there. And I think as you all are thinking about how to represent yourselves, if you are engaged in presentations and talks, you want to sell, sell up and actually accurately represent what you're doing and use the kind of language that would represent that. So um, with that said, I now want to talk about what some of that language um, could look like. So I went through to uh, look for um, highly um, skilled, you know, and position representation of someone who's getting paid to engage in minority tax work. So this is a DEI executive's resume, uh, a sample I found um, on the internet. And uh, one of the things I've talked about with trainees is that I, with all the things I've done, never learned how to describe all the things I've done. <laughs> so this language for you is supposed to help you go back, um, maybe rewrite some representations of yourself, maybe in conversations more accurately represent the work that you've done, and then also seek out resources to build your skill set in the work, which I'll talk about later in the strategies, in ways that can help you beyond the minority tax uh, work to be even helpful clinically, academically, um, or in leadership. So what are some of the things that you might use to describe or I might use to describe the work. Um, these are skills that are valuable in any context, including in healthcare, even if it's not acknowledged. So you making contributions to organizational culture, um, you might contribute to the developmental leadership of others around you, um, for example, by um, serving in a leadership role and being responsible for others um, to, you know, a complete a particular deliverable. You might be contributing to the training and development of people around you. I know tons of trainees who are teaching faculty, so their superiors, um, how to develop a different kind of lens for their work that could be represented. Um, you might be offering trauma-informed practices to your particular location if you're involved in town halls, been there, done that. Um, if you're involved in discussions, been there, done that. Um, after a number of tragedies, actually, uh, myself and a co-resident were leading for the department, including faculty, uh, trauma-informed discussions about um, some of the violence against Black people in our country. You might also describe your work as relationship building um, as well. Additionally, conflict resolution is, has been a big part of the work I've done, particularly as the chief resident of diversity and inclusion, but also just the participating in meetings where we're having conversations about difficult topics related to DEI. You also have a skill of analytical and critical thinking that manifests itself in the work that you do that could be pointed out. Lots of that strategy um, uh, stuff I talked about earlier is represented by strategy development. Public speaking is obviously a component. And then in some cases, contributing to policy and procedure implementation. Um, one example of that in my residency experience was what do we do with a racist patient? Um, so there have been contributions not only for myself, but also residents that are still there to policies to actually shape what happens when a patient makes a racist or discriminatory comment that targets a member of the healthcare workforce. Policy and procedure implementation. Um, and then finally, this is from an article in Forbes, what are some skills that we bring um, that might be a bit more, uh, seem a bit more generic, but very directly related to this work. Um, active listening, which is huge, openness, having to tolerate divergent opinions and perspectives, and that's connected to perspective taking, being able to sit in someone else's shoes, even someone that you disagree with, in hopes of getting closer to the goal for that particular project. Bridging is huge. This means you're extending something in a conversation to bring a person closer to you to have a conversation about something that you might disagree on. So for example, opening up a conversation about institutional racism, that requires all these things, including bridging. 
Uh, assumption testing means that I'm going to hold my assumptions, for example, uh, as I'm engaging in a conversation. That's necessary, especially when you're diving into the waters and not knowing if there's sharks present. It requires that skill to stay there. And then, of course, courage is a component of that work as well. So my um, encouragement to you all is, again, to go back and look through the work that you've done. See how this language could be applicable. Use it not only in the written form, but also conversationally to really, truly accurately represent the work that you've been doing. Um, the last thing I'll say about one of my roles is the Department Diversity Committee, uh, which I was on for two years, contributed to the diversity survey for the department, the presentation of that survey, um, um, the analysis of the data, all those sorts of things were done, conversations around different initiatives in the department, et cetera. And uh, I went to the website to look, and here's a picture. I am not in this picture. And I also looked at the text of that page and I'm not on the page. And this is not about me, but it's about my legacy, right? And how, how do you preserve your contributions? And it's not because I want to be on the website just to feel special, but it's because I want to accurately represent the work that I have done. And a part of doing that is having representations of your work in places that stick around for a while. Um, so this website could, ha could have lots of names on it, not just my own, um, listed as former contributors. That might be a way, but that's not what this website actually does. It just lists the current people on the committee and some really key um, parties like the department chair and the, the task force lead, et cetera. But there's a lot of memory here um, from my time there, from the residents that served with me on the committee that has not been preserved on the website. So the question for you is, is how can you preserve your contributions in institutional memory? And I will give you some suggestions for that. Um, and you can answer the question, but I'm gonna continue to the strategy so that we can create time for a discussion. So uh, I went through uh, some information about the tax, the taxes that we endure, um, a little bit of context so that you can understand where you sit currently as far as the cases for diversity out there and how people are thinking about them. Some people might be in the affirmative action space. A lot of people are in this business case space and then some people are morally engaged with their efforts. But here you are um, as a trainee, or faculty member who's trying to figure out how can you leverage this work to enhance your career because we are here to be successful as well as contribute and how do you do that while climbing up the academic and or clinical and or academic ladder uh actually administrative is what i should have said there um, i am a clinical um community psychiatrist for the most part i have some academic stuff that i do such as teaching in a department in the yale department of psychiatry um, and i also have some administrative stuff as well um, for example doing some grant work so some of us might be in some of these spaces more than others but it's still relevant to think about how might you progress in ways that you would like to for for your career so my first suggestion um, is to learn the language of value added, strategy number one. And that means really, again, looking at your applications to things, looking at how you are described in places. I could probably improve my bio, for example, and make sure that you have language that shows your stuff, right? Offer numbers that represent what you've accomplished, um, such as the number of programs that you've done, the number of people you have impacted, which might be thousands if you add up all the things that you're doing over the years. You want to use language like redesign, launched, modernized, orchestrated. Um, you want to be specific in what you do or how you describe what you did. You want to use words like create, led, managed. You want to offer examples of your efforts, which sometimes only makes its way into the personal statement, but can go other places too. You want to use words like spearheaded or committed. And let me turn the light back on. One second. Oh, there we go. Um, something else to consider as far as the language of value added is that people that are valuable, which you are, um, they always ask what's in it for me. Um, and there's been a social conditioning for us, particularly as racially minoritized medical students to believe that we only receive value um, by showing up and taking the seat that was given to us. Not true. And again, think about all the things I've just reviewed with you, um, especially if your institution believes in the business case, you are valuable. Um, so questions that you should be asking is, uh, are what's in it for me uh, as far as it relates to compensation. Some people are seeking pay for being on committees, for example, or work groups. Um, are you receiving protected time? So for that chief resident of diversity and inclusion position, 
we had a day of protected time to get that work done. Um, are you getting access to expertise? Um, so we were uh, mentored and supported by our program director and also that the, the committee lead, which was helpful. We, we needed more, but it was helpful um, to get that access. But I, if I could go back in time, would ask for a lot more support and maybe even ask that they pay for me to go um, as a resident to a training program that helps increase my DEI literacy and skill set. And finally, get a commitment to outcomes. Um, when you start whatever that minority tax um, labor is going to be, if you want me on this SWAT team, you need to guarantee that there will be this amount of representation in the incoming class. Um, or you need to guarantee you know, that X, Y, and Z will be a part of the approach that we take. Have that conversation, that negotiation before you say yes. It can be intimidating. At the same time, you have to remember your value. Uh, and that's related to strategy number two, an attitude adjustment. Um, so one, it is intimidating. Um, that requires you to be kind towards yourself and sometimes accept that you may not take that chance to ask that question or negotiate or represent yourself because at the moment you just didn't have it in you to give. And it's important to not beat yourself up, that you can have that self-compassion towards yourself. And it's actually a superpower, not a weakness. It's also important to ask for help when you need it. I was saying yes to lots of things and not asking for help from seniors. And many, many Black women specifically have been those that I go to to say, hey, what do you think about this opportunity? Not only within uh, healthcare, but also outside of it. How should I consider this? What should I be asking for as far as compensation? What's in it for me sort of stuff. It's also important to interrogate what is normal and expected. I had a um, student ask me, um, how to navigate being asked to do things and then worrying that after um, doing those things or, or rejecting to do those things, there might be like consequences or retaliation because it's just expected that you'll show up and do those things. And I, I first I asked, well, what do you think the consequences are going to be and why do you care? Right. That's something to critically reflect on. But two, why is it normal that you would sacrifice your clinical responsibilities to be on a committee? Why is that normative? And then finally, you kind of don't know what's around the corner all the time. So just really being prepared for twists and um, surprises can be really helpful. That way you're not feeling knocked down completely because you, you kind of had some bracing before that occurred. Um, strategy number three is uh, problem solving. And this is where you might be presented with some kind of dilemma within one of your minority tax labor positions um, or concern might be presented to you. That can be helpful to slow down and think about how do I approach a problem? Um, it can be stressful, anxiety provoking, and I'll give you an example of this. So um, during my residency program, I was chief of medical education during my fourth year. And that meant I was in a place responsible for the interns alongside my co-chief. And we were two black women uh, in this position for the first time ever as two chief residents on this floor. And something happened that required an intervention from administration. Uh, we had gone all the way up to the chief of the Department of Psychiatry for that institution. Our program director was involved. We were having these conversations uh, about something uh, inappropriate that a faculty member had engaged in. And at some point, they asked one of us to intervene in a way that was entirely inappropriate, entirely inappropriate, way beyond what we should have been doing um, as a resident, especially as it relates to intervening on faculty misbehavior. So what we did was we clearly defined the issue in our office together and some possible solutions. And then we consulted with stakeholders um, that had some level of influence and an interest in the problem. And it was a really respected faculty member who sat down with us, let us vent and helped us strategize about what to do. And what we did was pushed back on the recommendation and highlighted it using some language that that faculty member supported us by providing. And that kind of rinsing and repeating of that approach can really help you avoid making mistakes or help you get it help you from getting into things that you shouldn't be getting into because you feel this pressure to say yes to something even when it's inappropriate. Um, strategy number four, proactive stress recognition. These are some questions that you can ask yourself as emotional and cognitive audits to make sure that you're doing okay. 
Um, so how are you really doing? How's your brain functioning? What are others telling you about how things are going? Um, I really appreciated these questions. They were sometimes a little bit frustrating because I didn't want people to notice I was struggling. Um, but I really appreciate when people ask me and forced me to pause and reflect um, on these kind of audit type of questions because it, it made me sometimes slow down and really focus on what I needed to be doing to manage my stress. And that's connected to number five, which is stress management. So there's some prevention that you can put into place. So that means drinking water, eating food, um, resting, getting sleep, having some rituals in the morning or at bedtime to kind of calm yourself or prepare for the day, asking lots of questions to know what others expect of you, really being proactive about conflict. You don't want to let conflict fester and get bigger than it needs to be. Um, it's also important to think about your network. Are people around you promoting, affirming, encouraging you to be well? And then finally, what are you doing with your number of commitments? How are you balancing them? What are you keeping versus discarding? Um, because you really need to make some time to care for yourself. Number six, invest in skill development. This is huge and I've enjoyed this um, as, an, as a nerd, uh, dorky person. So if I'm gonna be doing these positions, I wanna know how to do it well. And oftentimes you do not get the kind of mentorship and supervision that you need to do it well. And at the same time, the kind of skills, the kind of um, attitude shifts, the kind of knowledge you have for this minority tax work can benefit you clinically and administratively and in other leadership positions. So you wanna spend time reading about from the Harvard Business Review, from Forbes, from Medium articles, from books. How do you improve your skills in leadership, communication, and mentoring? Go to a training. Um, how can you develop some strong organizational skills, manager skills, mentoring skills? And the better you become at your job, the less time you have to take away from doing other things like research. You also want to learn the basics of change management, especially if you're being responsible for a change process. You want to know what not to do. Um, which I learned after training, negative expertise is huge. What that means is that you don't just know what to do, but you know what not to do, what to avoid, what the pitfalls are. And then finally, you want to learn about program development strategies before developing a program. <laughs> so lots of times you're offered these things or you might sign up to do these things that you're not prepared for. And that learning is an investment in being really good at that in that moment, but also can give you future returns as well. And this essay, I would encourage you all to read. It talks about this in more detail. Number seven, um, write, publish, present, nominate, and disseminate. <laughs> so we talked about how to, to get your mark out there, to have some institutional memory. And these are some suggestions for what you might do. Um, you might have a personal blog where you recount the work that you've done. It's a lot more lively and intimate than just listing it on a CV. Uh, you might write medium articles. I've enjoyed doing those. I have more to come in that area because it helps me to not only connect with my own experience, but be transparent and vulnerable with others. You might do scholarly publications. You might present at conferences, describing the work that you're doing. You also might develop a relationship with the people who represent your institution. So making sure that you're getting into the department newsletter on the department website. So there's some tracking that can be um, done through Google on the brochure. We talk about these things as being tokenistic and they can be when you are not thinking about what's in it for me. And one of the ways that you might get some benefit from this is that you're getting your voice out there, your perspective. You might be opening yourself up to a network that you wouldn't have had access to previously as well. And I've personally had that happen from doing what you would consider to be low yield things like the department newsletter, um, where people will email you or they'll think about you and offer you an opportunity to do something a bit bigger. Research and nominate yourself for awards or ask your friends to nominate you. <laughs> like um, there is something to being uh, ignored um, and not seen and that can result in you not being nominated. So research, nominate yourself or have someone nominate you. Um, request testimonials, have people talk about what it's like to work with you. Um, have them use that value added language that I've included above. You also wanna be transparent on social media. Um, what is it that you're doing? Sharing that with other people, which can feel like self-promotion and it is, but at the same time, what's in it for you might be some opportunity that you would not have been able to access otherwise. Uh, and then finally, you want to build a network of people that can increase your access to opportunities. So just really thinking deeply about who might you share something with as far as your work to, to get some benefits from it in that way. 
The last strategy um, before I open up the floor is to push for tax reform. There are articles out there about reforming the tax that you can um, that you can find. And some suggestions are to increase representation of diversity. So the work is spread more out amongst those people who are considered to be diversity um, that has pros and cons. Also, a majority subsidy is suggested. So having engagement requirements for privileged identities and groups, that it's not just the minoritized person's job, it's everyone's job, everyone should contribute, and maybe some more than others because they've historically not contributed as much. You wanna also be thinking about policies that reward the efforts. For faculty, that might be promotion uh, policies. Um, for residency, that might be awards um, or at the medical school. Is there an award that could be created that would acknowledge and honor someone who's engaging in this minority tax effort? We had those awards in my residency program and a little bit in my medical school, mostly around community service. Um, you also want to make sure that you're having uh, involvement in efforts that have identifiable goals with clear metrics for success, that you're contributing your time to something that will result in something, not just conversations that are talking, but people who are walking the walk and know where they're going. Those are really high yield efforts to involve yourself in. And if you're on a committee or work group that doesn't have that, tax reform is creating that uh, in ways that will require some advocacy. Lastly, access to learning and growth opportunities, hopefully funded by your institution. So sending you to trainings and workshops and things like that to kind of grow your skill set. So with that said, um, that is the content of the presentation today. Uh, I wanted to leave with this quote before we start the, the question and answer portion, which is how you love yourself is how you teach others to love you. And I strongly feel this is connected to the minority tax because as I've loved myself more, I've been teaching others how to love me and value me. And that has shaped the kind of work that I engage in, the people I'm around, um, the places that I leave because they're not loving me or valuing me in the way that they should. And that confidence, that, that sense of empowerment to do that really requires first that you love yourself and value yourself. Um, so I appreciate you all listening uh, and we'll see if there's any questions from the group. Um, we'll also, as people are thinking about that, we'll ask that people um, who've watched the presentation live or the recording, um, please fill out the evaluation, which I'll show for you in just a moment. All right, um, so what I'm gonna do is switch the screen over so that we can see the evaluation form. And um, the goal here is that you all will offer feedback on the presentation, um, even if you've watched the recording, what was helpful, not helpful, um, what can we tweak um, for future audiences who might be viewing the presentation, because the goal is to be useful as a part of this particular initiative. Um, I also want to personally thank everyone here um, and also the Steve Fund for um, sponsoring this opportunity to connect with you all as medical students of color. Uh, and I look forward to seeing what comes of your engagement in this particular topic. So one question um, that I'll answer before we close is, how do you balance not wanting to be pigeonholed into being the DEI person while also wanting to take on these projects due to your own passion for this area and the potential for future opportunities? How do you communicate that to colleagues? And, and that, you know, that's a great question because it's so interesting how, um, people shut down when the topic of DEI or JEDI or belonging efforts comes up. They shut down and they no longer are considering, again, the knowledge required, the skills that you need, and the attitudinal shifts required to be successful in that work. 
what I think is helpful and what I'm happy to partner with any person on is illustrating the information in this presentation. <laughs> so actually making it clear that people that engage in this work um, are demonstrating skills, attitudes, knowledges that can be helpful outside of this particular lane. But, and that can help with not being pigeonholed. But in addition to that, you have to figure out how to carve out space for other things as well in a way that feels right to you. And sometimes that means being on a committee that you may not have as much of an interest in, but might represent an opportunity to do two things. One, you're on the committee or on the work group or involved in the project, so it represents some diversity on your CV or resume. But two, you never know if there's gonna be an opportunity to offer something that taps into that passion for DEI work. So an example of that is within the APA, tons of committees. Um, one was the council on medical education and lifelong learning. That was this council. Never considered being on this council before, but I found myself in front of this council to support this effort to address um, racism um, and discrimination from patients and their families and guests towards healthcare workers. So it was a space that had some of my medical education interest. It wasn't specifically focused on DEI, but there was opportunities there to actually infuse that interest into actual projects. So on my CV and resume, not only do I have a medical education committee focus that I can list, I also have a project that's connected to that that I can represent as well. But I think the, the messaging and the communication around this work uh, is important on its own, really describing what it is that you're doing. Are you managing change? Are you doing conflict resolution? Using that language first can help. And then secondly, making sure that you have some diversity um, on your CV and resume so that people know that you can do other things while that cultural shift is still happening. So thank you for that question. Um, and I, I do honestly mean if someone wants to write about this, let me know. We can do that. All right. So I'll see if we have any other questions before we close. And I want to leave actually the rest of the time we're at the 1258 mark for you all to fill out the um, fill out the question of the survey here to let us know how we're doing. Um, so I'll leave that up. And with that, I will I will close on my end. And I thank you all for your attention um, and listening.